Hello everyone, welcome back to the Steely Dan Iceberg. This is a direct continuation of the last part, so if you haven't already, please watch it. Now before we get started, I would like to mention some corrections of things that I got wrong from the last part. First is with the final entry of the last part, which mentions how Everything Must Go was meant to be the final album. This theory is actually false, since, as noted by this comment, Fagan did approach Becker in regards to producing another album, but he declined due to his health problems during that time. So no, Everything Must Go wasn't meant to be the last album, but it was unfortunately left that way. Another smaller mistake that I made was with the song You Got the Bear, where I said that it was only performed live once. However, it was actually played four times throughout 2011, as noted by this comment in setlist.fm. With that being said, let's just get right back into the iceberg. The second arrangement was purposely destroyed. According to rumor, the deletion of the second arrangement was no accident. Supposedly, Becker and Fagan purposely destroyed the song out of spite against MCA so they couldn't have a big hit from Gaucho, therefore making less money from it. The duo allegedly made up the junior engineer accident story for interviews in order to cover up the truth. This theory doesn't make that much sense considering that MCA did get their big hit in Hey 19 anyway, but it's a theory nonetheless. Charlie Freak is a true story. As the Sentry states, the song Charlie Freak was supposedly based on a true story. According to this account, Walter Becker met a homeless man on the streets of Brooklyn who wanted to sell him a gold ring. Like in the song, he was given about $20 in exchange for the ring, but he spent it on drugs and overdosed. Eventually, Becker found him dead, so he went home to write about the experience. This whole thing seems illogical and baseless, but don't worry guys, I can confirm this story is true. My uncle was the homeless guy, and now he works for Steely Dan. Heartbreak Souvenir was sold on eBay. Allegedly, a reel containing the mythical Heartbreak Souvenir from the Lost Gaucho was sold on eBay in the early 2010s. According to this email, it was sold for about $900. One person approached the buyer in an attempt to purchase a .wav file of the reel's contents, but they were verbally berated after the suggestion. Taking into consideration the supposed attitude of the owner of this reel, as well as the fact that this may be the only existing copy, it's very possible that this demo may never surface publicly. 11 Tracks References There were two lines in 11 Tracks of Whack that I noticed were in reference to earlier parts of Steely Dan's history. The first is in the album opener, down in the bottom, with the line, Here in the suburbs is where it's hard to tell if I got the bear or if the bear got me, which is a reference to the Asia outtake, You Got the Bear. The second is one I'm not too sure about, but it seems plausible. In the song Cringe Maker, the line, Down in the kitchen now it's Dog Eat Dog, could likely be a reference to the song Dog Eat Dog from a film soundtrack that Becker and Fagan did, which I will talk about later. However, I'm not totally sure that it's a reference per se, since Dog Eat Dog is also a pretty common figure of speech. FM AM Mix Since AM radio stations weren't going to play a song promoting FM, there exists an edited version of FM which replaces the word in the chorus with AM. The people who made this edit simply grabbed the A from Asia and put it over the F. Becker became an avocado farmer after Gaucho. After Gaucho rep production in late 1980, Steely Dan disbanded. Fagan and Becker parted ways until their reunion in 1993. So what did they do in the meantime? It is well known that Fagan continued in the music industry throughout the decade. He wrote songs for other artists, released The Nightfly in 1982, and had some contributions to film soundtracks such as Bright Lights, Big City, and Heavy Metal. But where did Becker go? Well, for starters, he quit doing drugs, smoking, and drinking alcohol. He then moved to Hawaii and became an avocado farmer. By the mid-80s, he eventually got back into music production, producing albums for many different artists. The period between 1981 and 1993 is an interesting one for Steely Dan, but the thing I really wanted to highlight here is Becker's short career as an avocado farmer. It's very possible that someone, somewhere, has eaten a Walter Becker-grown avocado. Tom and Don Tapes, Volume 1 This is a comedy album which was a collaborative effort between Donald Fagan and Tom Schiller released in 2013. Many of the tapes consist of Schiller doing an impression or accent with Fagan either laughing, asking Schiller's character questions in an interview style, or both. We're here with uh, Jihoso, as, as he calls himself, who's a Somali pirate. Uh, tell me, uh, so uh, how would you describe your life? Piece of cake. <laughs> I went to, went to the bell and I beat, beat, beat ships and I saw the turtle hat with the grappling picks. And we went up the top and we took the man and we tripped <laughs> and I tried to get him. <laughs> I see. <laughs> 
Some of it is off-color, as a good handful of the tapes rely on stereotypes or political commentary as their source of comedy. Some of it is also kind of funny to me, but at the same time, my sense of humor has devolved to a point where I'm laughing at stupid stuff like a mole car. This album is incredibly hit or miss for me, but there are some bright spots, such as the aforementioned mole car and real audio of Donald Fagan saying Obama. You're Bo Obama. You're a friend of Obama's. I'm a dog walker for Bo Obama. I have a wonderful, wonderful time walking the dog around Washington, D.C. You've got to walk it like you talk it or you'll lose that beat. This is the name of a lost comedy drama film which was released in 1971. It was directed by Peter Locke and featured a soundtrack by Steely Dan, or the moniker they were known as for this project, the original soundtrack. The movie's story is said to follow one Carter Fields, played by Zalman King, as he finds life's meaning. Critics at the time thought the movie wasn't very good. One complimented it backhandedly by saying that though it contains some brilliant bits of hilarity, you have to endure through too much tiresome crud to get to the good stuff. To this day, it hasn't surfaced at all since its initial screening at theaters. The director is an objective towards a future home media release though, with him saying that it all ends up coming out. All that currently remains of this film is some newspaper ads and reviews, as well as the soundtrack. The band that did the soundtrack consisted of Walter Becker on the bass and guitar, Donald Fagan on the keyboards, Denny Dias, with his last name being misspelled as Diaz, on the guitar and percussion, and John Disapolo on the drums. It also featured lead vocals by Kenny Vance on Roll Back the Meeting and Marty Cooper Smith on the title track, though he went uncredited for it. It is said in the biography Reeling in the Years by Brian Sweet that Fagan was actually coerced into a speaking role for the film in one scene, but it was cut from the film because, well, it wasn't funny. In an interview with a radio show, Fagan reenacted the scene as Becker narrated it, with Fagan asking at the end, Was it funny? Did you laugh? None of the interviewers laughed, and Becker said that this is why the scene was cut, and at the same time also said that it was the best scene in the whole movie. Some people have alleged to have seen it on the Pluto TV 70s movie channel, however it seems to haven't been played since then. I think that it would be interesting to see one day, but from what people have said about it, maybe it's lost for a reason. Your Gold Teeth 2 Abridged Live FM Broadcast Remastered FM Broadcast Ellis Memorial Stadium Memphis Tennessee 30th of April 1974 Remastered Very weirdly, if you try to search up Your Gold Teeth on Google, this is the first thing that gets suggested. It gets even weirder than that though. When you click on it, it brings up the whole title but with a vinyl rip of and information for Your Gold Teeth 1 and the lyrics listed under it are for Your Gold Teeth 2. This long title actually exists as a YouTube video but it's just one of the many instrumental jams that they played in 1974. This one being, as the title suggests, from a performance in Memphis, Tennessee on April 30th, 1974. Two Against Nature, Alternate Cover, and Song List. Before the decision to use Michael Northrup's photographs for Two Against Nature was made, this cover was used instead. It features Donald and Walter in lab coats in front of a large blackboard as they look at a diagram of what appears to be a crude drawing of a cow farting with the label methane equals energy. There is also other humorous flavor text such as pi equals 3.14 and a drawing of two pigs falling with the caption all pigs fall at the same speed. What's interesting to note here is the alternate song list featured. It contains 13 songs, unlike the 9 that were featured on the final product, a different song order, and some unfinalized names, these being Runaway, Gothic, Shame, Abby, Negative Girls, and Cousin, which turned out to be Janie Runaway, Almost Gothic, What a Shame About Me, Gaslighting Abby, Negative Girl, and Cousin Dupree, respectively. The four other songs, Someone, Sharon, Tigers, and Things, are more or less an enigma. Some speculate that Things is likely an early version of Things I Miss the Most from the next album, Everything Must Go, but the rest remain a total mystery. American Bandstand Performances American Bandstand was a music performance and dance show which was hosted by Dick Clark and aired between 1952 and 1989. It would usually feature teenagers dancing to top 40 hits of the time, introduced by the host, and at least one act would show up to lip sync one of their new singles, with them doing so simply because the studio wasn't equipped for proper live performances. One of the guests that happened to appear on the show was Steely Dan, who was there to perform songs from Countdown to Ecstasy on November 10th, 1973 for the 11th episode of the 17th season. From what I could gather, they played Mild School and Bodhisattva, with the only available footage being of the former. 
from the half playing from everyone, especially Walter who looks bored out of his mind, to the invisible horn section, this segment makes for a peculiar and funny watch. As for Bodhisattva, it is unknown whether it was featured as a lip sync performance or if it was just the audience dancing to it as the segment is impossible to find. The Midnight Special Lost Footage on an opposite note, Steely Dan was able to perform actual live music on a different TV program called The Midnight Special. It was a show similar to American Bandstand, which was produced by Burt Sugarman and ran between the years of 1973 and 1981. Unlike Bandstand and other similar programs, it didn't feature teenagers dancing to whatever was in the top 40 at the time or lip syncing guests, but rather it supported live music with a lavish soundstage set. Steely Dan appeared on the show early in its run, playing Do It Again, Reelin' In The Years, Showbiz Kids, and My Old School over three appearances. However, footage is only available for the former two, while the latter two, along with another performance of Reelin', are currently lost. An interesting thing to note about these lost performances is that a censored version of Showbiz Kids was played because it has a swear in its lyrics, which definitely wasn't allowed on television at that time. There have been a few search efforts for this lost segment, though they have all come up fruitless so far. Tell Me A Lie Tell Me A Lie was one of the many pre-dance songs which was written by Fagan and Becker during their days as staff writers in the Brill Building and was intended for other artists to record. This particular song was meant for a group called The Grassroots, but it was never recorded by them. It was eventually passed on to a group called The Soundalikes, which was recorded, except that it is incredibly rare. The song is described as being a terrible country cover with the only saving grace being the good lyrics. It, along with another song titled Proud To Be Your Slave, another song with similar circumstances, were found by one Jim Steele, a user of the Dandem's Blue Book, who actually shared a short clip of the song and lyrics along with his email. However, his email is dead and the clip along with it. Luckily, the lyrics are still available within the archives of the Blue Book. Ever since then, Tell Me A Lie has been nearly impossible to find. The closest thing available is the Kent Fox version for sale on eBay, though the writers of that version are supposedly different from the Soundalikes cover. A quick update here, the Sun Alex version of Tell Me A Lie has actually been found and was uploaded to YouTube by Skeevy Daniel. I will leave it linked in the description. Time Out of Mind is actually about Dungeons and Dragons. People call Time Out of Mind a quote unquote thinly veiled song about heroin. But isn't it more accurate to think that it's about Dungeons and Dragons? Think about it. Chasing the dragon, slaying monsters, water changing to cherry wine, magic, silver will turn to gold, Grabbing the bag after slaying monsters. Think about it. Letters to Luke Wilson and Wes Anderson In 2006, Donald Fagan and Walter Becker wrote personal letters to Luke Wilson and Wes Anderson. The first I will talk about is the letter to Wilson. At the beginning, the duo congratulates him and his brother, Owen Wilson, for a film they starred in, Bottle Rocket, and they praise it. The letter then takes a sharp turn in tone as it talks about how Owen's new film, You, Me, and Dupree, plagiarizes the song Cousin Dupree and how he is generating major harsh-ass karma for himself. Fagan and Becker then ask Luke to persuade Owen to come to a concert in Irvine, California to formally apologize to their fans. They finally mention to Luke in a PPS how they thought he was the older Wilson because of his maturity, though Owen is actually older according to Wikipedia. Then there's the letter to Wes Anderson. Fagan and Becker start off by saying that they are obsessive fans of world cinema, and similarly to the other letter, they praise Bottle Rocket, but they also get into criticizing Anderson's subsequent films. They give Anderson two strategies to improve his films. The first is to let go of his past and move on towards new challenges, with a title song for Anderson's next film, Darjeeling Limited, written by Donald being attached. The second is to simply make a Bottle Rocket 2, with a title song for that being attached as well. The letter ends with the two asking Anderson to fire musical supervisor Mark Mothersbaugh and to send $400,000 to the representative by tomorrow, as well as the humorous closing, We Remain Your Abject Servants, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan. Steely Dan for the SNES Steely Dan has had many popular video game adaptations in the early 90s for the Super Nintendo, which includes Super Dan World, Walter's Time Machine, Donald is Missing, and of course, the super classic, Super Steely Dan. However, these games have become lost media over the years, with no working copies ever surfacing. Found cartridges simply showed this anti-piracy screen and turned off the console, breaking it in the process. I remember when I was but a young lad, I had a copy of Super Dan World, but it bricked after 19 uses. This story is 100% true. You can ask my uncle who works at Steely Dan because he was there when it happened.
Countdown to Ecstasy hidden speech. In two of the songs on Countdown to Ecstasy, there are some elements of speech hidden within them, Showbiz Kids and King of the World. King of the World's hidden speech occurs in the instrumental break between the second chorus and the bridge. It sounds like it's coming out of a megaphone and it's hard to make out, but from what I heard, it's Walter saying something along the lines of, Earth to Dan, I think my face is on fire. Is this a bunch of beasts or a bunch of crap? Showbiz Kid's hidden speech is a lot harder to make out since the sounds being played at the end are too hectic and overlap what is being said. nineteen seventy two Texas tapes. Apparently, recordings of live performances from nineteen seventy two do indeed exist. These recordings are said to be from October twenty eighth and October twenty ninth in Houston and Arlington respectively, where the Dan opened up for the Kinks. Over the course of these performances, songs which haven't had live recordings surface such as Fire in the Hole, Change of the Guard, and Dallas were played, with only a fool would say that being played as an instrumental jam, similar to how your gold teeth two was played in nineteen seventy four. It is unknown whether or not Dallas was a song they regularly played during this time, or if it was played because they were in Texas. More notable is that the songs meant for David Palmer, Megashine City, Take My Money, and Hellbound Train were also confirmed to have been played during this era. However, these recordings remain in the hands of a private collector, who I will not mention by name out of respect for their privacy. 72 and 73 tours. There is not much known about Steely Dan's first two live tours outside of what has been said in different interviews and articles. In 1972, Pearl of the Quarter and Bodhisattva from Countdown to Ecstasy, Dog Eat Dog from the You Gotta Walk It soundtrack, as well as the songs on the Texas tapes were supposedly played throughout the rest of the year. One article from Metal Leg mentions a song titled Please Stop and Take Me by the Hand, though it is unknown whether this is simply an error or an early title for Bodhisattva. As for the 1973 tour, even less is known about it. Sources say that a mix of Camp by a Thrill and Countdown to Ecstasy songs were played, along with a cover of My Boyfriend's Back by the Angels, which was sung by the female backup singers. Another strange song allegedly played during this period was titled Make It Shine, which could either be a typo of Mega Shine City, I Mean to Shine, a song that Fagan and Becker wrote for Barbara Streisand, or something different entirely. One account of a 1973 show claims that in Salt Lake City, the band came out in Steely Dan themed baseball jerseys for the encore and even threw baseballs at the crowd. Pretzel Logic, Black Friday, and Chain Lightning are all connected. This theory states that the title track of Pretzel Logic, Black Friday, and Chain Lightning may all be connected thematically. For starters, they all contain a similar chord progression, especially during their beginnings. But how else are they connected? I theorize that they're all connected by history. Pretzel logic is obvious, considering that, as mentioned in the last part, it's about time travel. It mentions different figures and events from history, one being Napoleon, who was the Emperor of France from 1799 to 1804. Then there's Black Friday. The song isn't named after the shopping craze, but rather a real event in 1869 where the gold market crashed due to a conspiracy between investors. Finally, there's Chain Lightning. This one isn't too clear, but many believe that this song is about the reminiscence of former Nazis about the fascist dictatorship. The Nazi SS insignia is sometimes described as chain lightning, and the little man mentioned in the song is probably Adolf Hitler. Also, in one of the chain lightning demos, Fagan is heard saying 40 years later before the second verse. Years later. These are interesting connections, but at the end of the day, it's just a theory. The Asia Sweatpants. Apparently, these really ugly Asia-themed bootleg sweatpants were sold for $120. The design consists mostly of Asia and Steely Dan written in strange hot pink and bright teal colors, which is totally opposite to the sleek red, black, and white design of the actual album. It also has a weird-looking pink flame on the right pant leg, and lyrics from Deacon Blues plastered on the left pant leg as the old Steely Dan logo sits above them. I honestly feel sorry for anyone who bought these. A quick disclaimer here, these next two entries deal with somewhat offensive subject matter. I'm not trying to start any sort of political discussion, nor am I condoning any sort of prejudiced behavior. I'm just trying to inform you of things that I was surprised even happened in the dance history. If you don't want to see them, skip to this timestamp. Otherwise, let's continue. Fagan and Becker wrote a song with the N-word in it. 
Technically speaking, Donald Walter did indeed write a song with the N-word in it, however, they didn't actually write it themselves. The song in question is Deja Vu, Uptown Baby by Lord Tariq and Peter Guns, which heavily sampled Black Cow for the beat. In order to get the sample cleared, they gave Fagan and Becker an advanced payment of $115,000, 100% of the publishing royalties, and full writing credits for the song, which technically means that they wrote a song with the N-word in it. That also means that this is technically a real Donald Fagan quote. Pretzel Logic Blackface Ad there exists a blackface version of this pretzel logic advert where instead of this knockoff desperate Dan type character, a minstrel is holding the album instead. I get that it's supposed to represent the narrator of the title track who says he'd love to tour the Southland in a traveling minstrel show, but even for the time, it's an incredibly bad taste. I mean, it's made by British people, so what do you expect? On a side note, the Desperate Dan ad was actually made into a standee to advertise Can't Buy a Thrill, but was supposedly removed from stores due to copyright infringement. One of these was sold at auction for 60 pounds, or roughly 84 American dollars. Anyway, let's move on. Billy Joel Parallels Both Billy Joel and Steely Dan got their start in the early 70s, moved from New York to California and back again, are highly regarded for their respective albums released in 1977, have that one song that's about falling in love with a prostitute, and currently focus on live performances rather than writing and producing new material. People also like to hate them for some reason, but don't ask me why, I couldn't tell you. However, I think that's where the similarities end. Unlike Billy Joel, Steely Dan didn't really continue throughout the 80s, where Joel was at his peak of popularity. Conversely, Billy Joel quit making pop music by the 90s while Steely Dan was just getting started back up again during that time. Also, Joel's early albums mostly had session musicians, but later switched to a more permanent band, whereas the opposite occurred for the Dan. The amount of differences they have is basically innumerable, which just goes to show how unique they are compared to each other. Steely Dan TV Commercials There are a small handful of commercials for Steely Dan albums that appeared on television throughout the years. One of them is for Asia, which opens up from the announcer saying, Welcome to the land of Steely Dan to an Asian woman in a garden of sorts. Welcome to the land of Steely Dan. Another is for Two Against Nature, which features miscellaneous pictures, quotes, and footage on a CGI television similar to that of the cover of Plush TV Jazz Rock Party, but more cartoony. There's also this incredibly cursed advert for the very best of Steely Dan compilation album featuring the Steely Car. The last one I would like to mention isn't technically for Steely Dan, just one that featured them, but never ended up airing. It is said that there is a Lost Schlitz beer commercial which features a jingle done by the band with bilingual narration from Donald Fagan who spoke English and Jeff Baxter who spoke Spanish. The commercial was rejected by Schlitz because the Spanish word for grab in the line, when I get home from a hard day's work I grab for all the gusto I can get, has a second meaning which is, you know, the commercial is still lost to this day. Pearl of the Quarter 1971 Pearl of the Quarter is a song that likely goes even farther back than its feature on 1973's Countdown to Ecstasy and when it was played live in 1972. The story goes that singer-lyricist Mark Winkler auditioned to be Steely Dan's lead singer in 1971 before they hired David Palmer, and he was given a reel that contained an early demo of Pearl of the Quarter, among others. Winkler was then asked to learn the songs on the reel for the rest of the audition, but he ended up not making the cut. This version of Pearl of the Quarter probably still exists, but it is unknown whether anyone else other than Winkler has possession of it. We gave you the best of everything! Where did I go wrong? How could you do this to me? John Cone is a real song. John Cone refers to a mishearing of a gaucho outtake, assumed to be talking about my home, which is listed on this tape that was for sale on this strange website. It also contains such classics as The Lion and Shaken Confidential, likely being The Bear and Shanghai Confidential, respectively. It has since become a joke within the Steely Dan collecting community. But what if I told you John Cone was a real song? My uncle who works for Steely Dan happens to have this cassette tape and lyric sheet in his possession. I've listened to this tape, and John Cone turned out to be literally Donald banging on the keys for three hours straight with the lyrics talking about John Cone, this really cool ass guy, talking about John Cone, the only Cone I've ever known being repeated every so often.
It just goes to show that everyone should have an uncle that works at Steely Dan. The 8th Guitar Solo There is a legendary unreleased version of Peg that contains an elusive 8th guitar solo which was so incredible that they couldn't use it and had to settle for Jay Graydon's solo instead. I think that it speaks for itself. <laughs> This is quite possibly the greatest guitar solo in all of rock history. The Significance of 409 Think about it. Running time of Almost Gothic, Janie Runaway, and Book of Liars? 409. Time on the clock on the Nightfly cover? 409. One of the few dates that the Dan has only played once? 409. Formula 409 surface cleaner? 409. What does 409 mean? Well. 409 is a three digit number and 4 plus 9 is equal to 13. Subtract 3 from that and you get 10. Why is 10 significant? It can mean so many things. Lost 10 tracks on 2 Against Nature and Everything Must Go, a 10th studio album, but it's even more likely that this means absolutely nothing and I'm making all of this up. It's just a funny coincidence. Or is it? Cat Bui Kwok Doi is Fagin's best work. Cat Boy Quoc Doi is a Vietnamese folk album which is listed under the artist Donald Fagan on Spotify. It isn't featured under Fagan's actual artist page, but rather a different one that also has the name Donald Fagan. Some people think that it is simply an error on Spotify's end, but what if this was on purpose? What if this is the apex of Fagan's musical work? What if this Vietnamese folk album is something that Fagan is more proud of than anything else he has ever put out? According to this quote that definitely isn't made up, Fagan says that this album is his finest achievement. Who else to believe than the guy who made it? The Mop Song 2000 This entry refers to a very strange song written by Donald Fagan titled The Mop Song 2000. It was included in a book titled The 90s, A Look Back by Tony Hendra and Peter Elbling, which is a satirical look at many different facets of the decade, with the joke being that it was written before it even started. From what I can make of it, this song is about aliens cleaning up Earth after the humans have made a mess of it. I guess that this is supposed to satirize what sort of ridiculous hits would come in the following decade, considering that it isn't credited to Fagan himself, rather a fictional band named Stendor of the Rill, but it's still interesting nonetheless. Considering that it's a joke, it probably has never gone farther than the pages of this obscure book. Steely Dan Music Videos There are a plethora of fan-made Steely Dan music videos that are on YouTube, however, there are a small handful of these that are quite strange. For example, there is a rip of Dallas which switches to what appears to be an Asian woman putting on shoes halfway into the video. I'm pretty sure this is some sort of foot fetish thing, which makes it even more strange. Another oddity features idols dancing to here at the Western World, and as you would expect, it is very unfitting. This channel has uploads of Dan-related songs set to slideshows with weird pictures that range from boomer comics to a very low-quality image of Nigerian artist and political activist Fela Kuti smoking a huge blunt. Most eerily, there is this video which has various pictures of women set to a demo of everyone's gone to the movies. What's disturbing about this one is that these aren't just photos of random women. These are photos of the victims of serial killer Rodney Alcala, who you may know as the dating game killer. Accurate Predictions of the Future Similar to popular reality TV series The Simpsons, Steely Dan has been able to correctly predict the future through some of the lyrics of their songs. One notable instance of this occurring is with the song Rose Darling, which is about a husband having an affair with a mistress. Believe it or not, this is an accurate prediction of the Clinton Lewinsky scandal in 1998. Showbiz Kids, which is about the superficial lives that Hollywood types live, predicts the rise of social media influencers, specifically those on YouTube and TikTok, with the line, show business kids making movies of themselves, you know they don't give a fuck about anybody else. Most strange of all is Don't Take Me Alive, which is an obvious and accurate depiction of the Kenneth Lamar annoyed Domino's hostage situation in 1989. 13 years after the song's release. The second arrangement, Demo 3. 
The second arrangement demo 3 is a video made by The Cool Videos, who is known for such classics as the Cars series, HH Greg New Ad, and other miscellaneous shitpost videos. This particular upload is a faux third demo of the second arrangement, which features incredibly high-pitched vocals in a mashup with the song Ho Cakes by MF Doom. As much as I'd hate to admit it, this is where it all started for me. This was my first real exposure to Steely Dan and it was with this dumb meme video. But I will give it credit, as it's actually kind of funny and if I never saw this video, you probably wouldn't be watching this video right now. Hold on, give me a sec. Wait, there are actually four different demos of the second arrangement that have surfaced? Yes, there are indeed four different demos of this song that have surfaced. The first two are the most well-known, being the piano demo which features unfinalized lyrics and the low-quality tape demo which is near the final product but lacks some aspects such as a horn section. The actual third demo is a 6-minute instrumental which was found first as a 2-minute snippet on engineer Larry Frank's personal website and later surfaced in its entirety. The fourth demo, or at least some segments of it, is floating around on the internet. It first appeared on Facebook as a 30-second clip of a custom vinyl of the demo spinning on a turntable. It appeared again as the closing segment of a radio special titled Steely Spins, hosted by British DJ JP Paddock, who owns a work tape that contains this demo, among other outtakes. Babylon Sisters, Time Out of Mind, Glamour Profession, Second Arrangement, My Rival, and Third World Man. This clip has since caused drama within the general Steely Dan community, since Paddock intentionally speaks over the demo as it plays. He even puts a delay effect on some of it, as in his own words, I just gotta be careful with them bootleggers. DS Studios has a great video about the currently lost second arrangement demos, being this one and the tape that was found by Roger Nichols' family last year. I will leave it linked in the description. Steely Dan is the only member of the band. There is only one guy that has ever truly been in the band, that being the inventor of the blues himself, Steely Dan. Walter Becker and Donald Fagan were just two guys hired off of the street by Dan in order to represent his band in press material and live shows. His first known song is titled Oily Penguin Blues, being believed to be released in 1913 with a man named Tommy Johnson on acoustic guitar. Ooh, penguins. I hate them. They are so wrong. I hate the penguins. Yeah, they are so cringe. This whole time, the only brain behind the entire operation of Steely Dan is Steely Dan himself. What I have here is quite possibly the only footage available of this man, and today I will share it with the world. So, here it goes. Hello, it is me, Steely Dan, Steely Dan. I want those Grammys that time. Don't forget to listen to my new song. Go to too. Remember what they say. Go back, Jack, and do it again. So that was part two of the Steely Dan Iceberg. Similarly to the last part, if you have any suggestions of things I can talk about in future videos or any corrections for this video, please let me know in the comments. I would like to give a great and special thanks to the Steely Dan community as a whole. Without them, this video series wouldn't have been good, or even possible for that matter. I would especially like to thank Ambrose, who shared a good amount of information with me and helped clarify some things for this part. I also want to thank my good friend Mr. James Joe Rilla Johnson Jones for helping me construct this iceberg. Considering everything I really didn't go too in depth about in the first part, other things that I thought simply wouldn't fit on the iceberg, and the things I didn't know which were mentioned in the comments, there is going to be a part 3 where I will go deeper into these topics. It probably won't be as long as these two videos, but we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. As for what comes next, I will definitely talk about Steely Dan again in the future, but nothing is really set in stone after the final part. Again, please let me know in the comments if I got anything wrong or if there are any other interesting talking points which I could discuss in the third part. I really hope you enjoyed this video as much as, if not more than the last one, and I hope to see you again in the next video.